Good evening, everyone. I'm Stevenson Hill. I'm an ordained reverend to South Church. I'm a chaplain to South Church, a priest to South Church. I'm also a preceptor to South Church. I'm a preacher to South Church. I have a doctor in reading, doctor in evangelism, doctor in ministry, doctor in physics. All right, of course, I'm a professor of theology. With Mother's Day past and continuing on with spring and allergy season, with the war of Ukraine ongoing, and with increasing turbulent politics in the U.S. concerning the Supreme Court's decision, which I will be getting into much later in this. So, for this sermon, Theological Exploration, that's Theology 203 at this point, we will be taking a look at oaths and vows and the dangers of failing them, outside of what we already are witnessing. Many Christians, for the longest time, and especially these days, take many oaths upon themselves, and thanks to the oaths, they make themselves, and for making themselves at this point, this is one of the many reasons why politics here in America for the longest time, now prior to Trump and after, have been so heated, and again, why so many fallen Christians are continually condemning themselves, because of their belief they can do all that they wish to others, that they are allowed to dominate others, foregoing the actual limitations placed on them by Jesus to begin with, and using their oaths and vows they create for themselves to try to do so. So before we look into the theological oaths, and theology of oaths for that matter, let's look at what the Bible has to say about oaths. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with us, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, the hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having been the high priest forever at the order of Melchizedek. And that's Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. In your standout version. At that time, Herod the patriarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oath and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. And that's Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, in the standard version. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And that's Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37 in the standard version. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves, nor allow those who you would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, but when he comes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath, you blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath, you blind men. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? 
So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by the heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. That's Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 and 15 through 22, in standard version. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under a condemnation. And that's James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12 in the Standard Version. The Bible has a lot to say about oaths and vows and why a Christian shouldn't make them to begin with. If they make an oath and vow, especially invoking God, they are bound to forever uphold it, and if they should fail it in any way, period, they open themselves to being cursed and far worse. When God made his promised vow oath to Abraham, he didn't have a higher power to vow upon, so he vowed upon himself, since his nature is immutable. So when it comes to truth, vows, and oaths, make your yes be yes and your no be no. If you say yes and do otherwise, you bring upon yourself your own ruination at best. It is the same when it comes to the metric of judgment you as a Christian use on others. It will be returned to your own head. Which I'll be getting to later about this, by the way. Many Christians these days, especially those who fell to hatred and anger, make the great swaths of Christian nationalists who, because of their own actions, worldly devotion, idolatry, racism, xenophobia, aren't Christians for failing Christ's tenets and testaments, especially Majesty's Day, in which is encapsulated in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7-21, through 21, officially or otherwise, and I have to affirm this as a legally ordained reverend, that they are not Christians. They forget this fact or no longer believe that it applies to them. Thanks to their cheap grace and the belief God allows them to do as they wish to others, especially to those they hate, and as we know, hatred of others is an anathema to God, and it is rebellion against him and his will, and those consumed by it will not inherit the kingdom of God. Hatred is separation from God. So let's look at what theology says about oaths, vows, and what it means to break them, and the subsequent dangers it puts a person in. According to ATS Bible Dictionary, oath is defined as a solemn affirmation accompanied by an appeal to the Supreme Being. God has prohibited all false oaths and all useless and customary swearing in ordinary discourse, but when the necessity or importance of a matter requires an oath, he allows men to swear by his name, Exodus 22, verse 11, Leviticus 5, 1. To swear by a false god was an act of idolatry, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 7, and chapter 12, verse 16. Among the Hebrews, an oath was administered by the judge who stood up and adjured the party who was to be sworn. In this manner, our Lord was adjured by Caiaphas, Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. Jesus had remained silent under long examination when the high priest rising up Knowing he had to have a sure mode of obtaining an answer, said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ. To this oath, thus solemnly administered, Jesus replied that he was indeed the Messiah. An oath is a solemn appeal to God as to an all-seeing witness that what we say is true and an almighty avenger if what we say be false. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 16. Its force depends upon our conviction of the infinite justice of God, that he will not hold those guiltless who take his name in vain, and that the loss of his favor immeasurably outweighs all that could be gained by false witness. It is an act of religious worship in which account God requires it to be taken in his name, Deuteronomy 10.20, and points out the manner in which it ought to be administered, 
And the duty of the person who swears, Exodus chapter 22, verse 11, Deuteronomy 6, 18, Psalm 15, 4, and Psalm 24, 4. Hence atheists who profess to believe that there is no God and persons who do not believe in a future state of reward and punishment cannot consistently take an oath. In their mouths an oath can be only profane mockery. God himself is represented as confirming his promise by oath and thus confirming to what is practiced among men. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 13 and 16 verses 17. The oaths forbidden in Matthew chapter 5, verses 34 through 35, James chapter 5, verse 12, must refer to the unthinking, hasty, and vicious practices of the Jews, otherwise Paul would have acted against the command of Jesus. Romans chapter 1, verse 9, Galatians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. That person is obligated to take an oath whose duty requires him to declare the truth in the most solemn and judicial manner, though undoubtedly oaths are too often administered unnecessarily and irrevocably and taken with but slight con consciousness of the responsibility thus assumed. As we are bound to manifest every possible degree of reverence towards God, the greatest care is to be taken that we swear neither rashly nor negligently in making promises. To neglect performance is perjury, unless a promise can be contrary to the law and nature of God, in which case no oath is binding. See Corbin and Vows. A customary formula of taking an oath was, Lord, do so to me, and more also, that is, the Lord slay me as the victim sacrificed on many such occasions was slain, and punish me even more than this if I speak not the truth. Ruth chapter 1 verse 17, 1 Samuel 3 17. Similar phrases are these, as the Lord liveth, Jude 8 19, before God I lie not, Romans 9 1, I say the truth in Christ, 1 Timothy 2 verse 7. God is my record. Philippians 1 through 8. Several acts are alluded to as accompaniments of an oath, as putting the hand under the thigh, Genesis chapter 20. 4 verse 2 and Genesis chapter 47 verse 29 and raising the hand towards heaven Genesis chapter 14 verse 22 through 23 Deuteronomy 32 verse 40 Revelation 10 verse 5 link in the description by the way according to Watson's biblical and theological dictionary oath is defined as oath a solemn invocation of a superior power admitted to to be acquainted with all the secrets of our hearts and with our inward thoughts as well as our inward actions, to witness the truth of what we assert and to inflict his vengeance upon us if we assert what is not true or promise what we do not mean to perform. Almost all nations, whether savage or civilized, whether enjoying the light of revelation or led only by the light of reason, knowing the importance of truth and willing to obtain the barrier against falsehood, have had recourse to oaths by which they have endeavored to make men fearful of uttering lies, under the dread of an avenging deity. Among Christians, an oath is a solemn appeal for the truth of our assertions, the sincerity of our promises, and the fidelity of our engagements to the one only God, the judge of the whole earth, who is everywhere, present, sees, hears, and knows whatever is said, done, or thought in any part of the world. Such is that being whom Christians when they take an oath, invoke to bear testimony to the truth of their words and the integrity of their hearts. Surely then, if the oath be a matter of so much moment, it well behooves us not to treat them with levity, nor even to take them without due consideration. Hence we ought with the utmost vigilance to abstain from mingling us in our ordinary discourse and from associating the name of God with low or disgusting images, or using it on trivial occasions as not only profane levity in itself, but tending to destroy that reverence of the supreme majesty which ought to prevail in society and to dwell in our own hearts. The former oaths by Dr. Paley, like other religious ceremonies, have in all ages been various, consisting, however, for the most part, some bodily action, and on the description former words, among Jesus, juror held up his right hand and toward heaven, Psalms 144.8, Revelations 10.5, the same form is retained in Scotland still. Among the Jews also an oath of fidelity was taken by their servants, putting his hand under his thigh of his Lord, Genesis 24.2. 
Among the Greeks and Romans, the form varied, and with the subject and occasion of the oath, in private contracts, the party took hold of each other's hands, while they swore to the performance, or they touched an altar of the god by whose divinity they swore upon more solemn occasions. It was a custom to slay a victim, and the beast being struck down with certain ceremonies and invocations gave birth to the expression ferrier pactum, and to our English phrase translated from this of striking a bargain. The form of those in Christian countries are also very different, but in no country in the world worse contrived either to convey the meaning or impress the obligation of an oath than our own. The juror with us, after repeating the promise of affirmation which the oath is intended to confirm, adds, So help me God, or more frequently, the substance of an oath is repeated to the juror by the magistrate, who adds in the conclusion, So help me God. The energy of the sentence resides in the particle, so, that is, and bleach upon condition of my speaking the truth, or performing this promise, and not otherwise, may God help me. The juror, while he hears or repeats the words of the oath, holds his right hand upon the Bible, or other book containing the Gospels, and at the conclusion, kisses the book. This obscure and elliptical form, together with the levity and frequency of them, has brought about a general inadvertency to the obligation of oaths, which, both in religious and political view, is much to be lamented, and it merits public consideration where the requiring of oaths upon so many frivolous occasions, especially in the customs and in the qualification of petty officers, has any other effect and then it makes such sanctions cheap in the minds of the people. A pound of tea cannot travel regularly from the ship to the consumer without costing half a dozen oaths at least, and the same security for the due discharge of their office, namely, that of an oath is required from a church warden and an archbishop, from petty constable and chief justice of England. Oaths, however, are lawful and whatever to be formed, the signification the same. Historians have justly remarked that when the reverence for enough began to diminish among the Romans, and the loose Epicurean system, which discarded the belief of providence, was introduced. The Roman honor and prosperity from that period began to decline. The Quakers refused to swear upon any occasion, founding their scruples concerning the lawlessness of oath upon our Savior's prohibition, swear not at all, Matthew chapter 5, verse 34. But it seems our Lord there referred to the vicious, wanton, and unauthorized swearing in common discourse, and not to judicial oaths. For he himself answered, when interrogated upon earth, oath, Matthew chapter 26, verse 60 to 64, Mark chapter 14, verse 61. The Apostle Paul also makes use of expressions which contain the nature of oaths, Romans chapter 1, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, 2 Corinthians 1, 18, Galatians 1, 20, Hebrews 6, chapter 13, 6, verse 13 through 17. The administration of oaths supposes that God will punish false swearing, with more severity than a simple lie or breach of a promise, for which belief there are following reasons. Perjury is a sin of greater deliberation. It violates a superior confidence. God directed the Israelites to swear by his name, Deuteronomy. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, and was pleased to confirm his covenant with the people by an oath, neither of which it is probable he would have done had he not intended to represent oaths as having some meaning and effect beyond the obligation of a bare promise. Link in description, by the way. According to the International Bible Encyclopedia, oath is defined as oath sheba, probably from sheba, seven, the sacred number, which occurs frequently in the ritual of an oath, forkas, and the strong word Allah, by which a curse is actually invoked upon the oath breaker, Septuagint. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 70 to 74, Peter first denies his Lord simply, then with an oath, Sheba, then invokes a curse, and thus passing through every stage of asseveration. 1. Law regarding us. The oath is the invoking of a curse upon one's own self if one has not spoken the truth, Matthew chapter 26, verse 74, or if one fails to keep a promise, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 6, 1 Samuel 20, verse 17, 2 Samuel 15, 21, and 2 Samuel 19, verse 23, they played a very important part not only in lawsuits, Exodus 22, 11, Leviticus 6, verse 3 and 5, and state affairs, but also in the dealings of everyday life, Genesis chapter 24, verse 37, Genesis chapter 50, verse 5, Judges chapter 21, verse 5, 1 Kings, verse 18, verse 10, Ezra, 
chapter 10, verse 5, the Mosaic laws concerning us were not meant to limit the widespread custom of making us so much as to impress upon the people the sacredness of an oath, forbidding one on the one hand swearing falsely, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, Leviticus 19, 12, Zechariah 8, 17, etc. And on the other, swearing by false gods, which latter was considered to be a very dark sin, Jeremiah 12, 16, Amos 8, 14. In the law, only two kinds of the false swearing are mentioned, false swearing of a witness and false observation upon oath regarding a thing found or received, Leviticus 5, 1, Leviticus 6, 2. Compare Proverbs 29, 24. Both required a sin offering, Leviticus 5.1. The Talmud gives additional rules and lays down certain punishments for false swearing. In the case of a thing found, it states that the false swearer must pay. Makoth 2.3 and Shavuoth 8.3. Sorry about the butchering of those, by the way. The Jewish interpretation of the third commandment is that it is not concerned with us, but rather forbids the use of the name Yahweh in ordinary cases. So, Talmud. Two, forms of swearing. Swearing in the name of the Lord, Genesis fourteen twenty two, Deuteronomy six thirteen, Judges twenty one seven, Ruth one seventeen, etc., was a sign of loyalty to Him. Deuteronomy ten twenty, Isaiah forty eight eleven, Jeremiah twelve sixteen. We know from Scripture the above that swearing by false gods was frequent, and we learn also from the newly discovered Elephantine papyrus that the people not only swore by Yahweh or by the Lord of Heaven but also among a certain class of other gods, for example, Aaron Bethel, and by Esam. In ordinary intercourse, it was customary to swear by the life of the person addressed, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 3, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, by the life of the king, 1 Samuel 17, 55, 1 Samuel 25, 26, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 11, by one's own head, Matthew chapter 5, verse 36, by the earth, Matthew chapter 5, verse 35, and by the heaven, Matthew chapter 5, verse 34, and Matthew chapter 23, verse 22. By the angels, by the temple, Matthew chapter 23, verse 16, and by different parts of it, Matthew 23, verse 16. By Jerusalem, Matthew chapter 5, verse 35, Kimber, Kibutha 2, 9. The oath by heaven, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, and Matthew chapter 23, verse 22. It's counted by Jesus as the oath in which God's name is invoked. Jesus does not mean that God and heaven are identical, but he desires to rebuke those who paltered with an oath by avoiding a direct mention of the name of God. He teaches that such an oath is a real oath and must be considered as sacredly binding. The formula. Not much is told us as to the ceremonies observed in taking an oath. In patriarchal times, he took upon the oath, he put his hand under the thigh of him whom the earth was Taken, Genesis chapter 23, verse 28, and Genesis chapter 47, verse 29. The most usual form was to hold up the hand of heaven, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, Exodus 6, 8, Deuteronomy 32, 4, Ezekiel 20, verse 5. The wife suspected of unfaithfulness when brought before the priest had to answer a man, a man, to his adoration, and this was considered to be an oath on her part. Numbers 5, 22. The usual formula of an oath was either God is witness between me and thee, Genesis thirty-one fifty, or most commonly as Yahweh or God liveth, Judges eight nineteen, Ruth three thirteen, Second Samuel two seventeen, Jeremiah thirty-eight sixteen, or Yahweh be a true and faithful witness among us, Jeremiah forty-two five. Usually the penalty invoked by the oath was only just suggested, Yahweh or God do so to me, Ruth one seventeen, Second Samuel three nineteen thirty-five, First Kings twenty-two. 2 Kings 6.31, in some cases the punishment was expressly mentioned. Jeremiah 29.22, now it suggests that in general the punishment was not expressly mentioned because of the superstitious fear that the person swearing, although speaking the truth, might draw upon himself some of the punishment by merely mentioning it. Philo expresses the desire that the practice of swearing should be discontinued and the Essenians use no oaths. Oaths permissible. Four. Those are permissible to Christians as shown by the example of our Lord Matthew chapter twenty six verse sixty three and of the you know Paul, second Corinthians one twenty three, Galatians one twenty, and even of God himself, Hebrews chapter six verses thirteen through eighteen. Consequently, when Jesus said swear not at all, Matthew chapter five verse thirty four, he was laying down the principle that the Christian must not have two standards of truth, but that his ordinary speech must not be sacredly true as his oath. In the kingdom of God, where the principle holds sway, an oath becomes unnecessary. 
link in the description, by the way. Sorry, that was pretty lengthy, but to be fair, this is going to be incredibly lengthy. 25 minutes in already, and I'm not even... I'm barely even started. Mm. And I do apologize for that, but I do have a lot to say with everything that's been happening for the past number of weeks. In the article, Should We Make Vows Today? by John O'Reed, Oath Vows and Making Them and the Warnings, Why John Reed Defines Oath Vows as... Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 through 37. Jesus advises us not to swear at all, but say simply, yes or no. Verse 37, if we are honest, we have not, no need to take an oath. He goes so far as to say that anything more than yes or no has its source in the Father lies. John 8, 44. There are several aspects of these verses. The overall statement Jesus makes is that we do not need to swear by anything to confirm that our statements are true. A Christian's word should be as bound as the old saying goes. We should be so bound by the ninth commandment that nothing else is necessary. The not so obvious meaning of these verses is that we should not lightly give an oath or make a vow to God to acquire something. We have many desires, and some might take it upon themselves to ask God for them, promising to perform a certain deed if he gives it to them. Jesus warned that once we get what we want, we may forget what we promised to perform. Number 30 shows that God does not take reneging on our promises lightly. Should Christians make vows today? God tells us the best course to take in Matthew chapter 5, verse 34, But I say to you, do not swear at all. James writes that it is best not to make them so that we do not fall into judgment. James chapter 5, verse 12, Though God advises us not to make a vow, we can make vows if we so choose. In making one, however, we should consider the examples of Hannah and Jephthah. We should seriously contemplate what we are requesting and what we are promising, always asking ourselves, Can I make good on what I promised? We are a special people to God. He has called us and has great love for us. He hears our prayers as we obey and love Him. We should give a great deal of thought as to whether we need to make a vow when we have such instant and open access to the very throne of God. He does indeed hear our prayers and He answers them according to what He sees as good for us. Why should we make vows when we know that he will give us or deny us what is best for us? Link in description, by the way. In another article entitled Swear Not, John Reed goes further into detail about why making oaths is dangerous. James chapter 5, verse 12. How James addresses this to his audience tells us he considers it an extremely serious matter. He uses of, above all, suggests that we should be especially careful on this point. It is as if he is saying, make sure you catch this point because it may be the most important one. Swearing oaths is not a trivial matter. In the Old Testament, taking oaths by God's name was more prevalent, even commanded. See Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. But God holds those he has called out of this present evil world to a higher standard. The ancient Israelites were carnal human beings whose behaviors had to be constrained by statute. Knowing they would swear oaths, God directed them to take them honestly and only in his name, thus regulating and elevating the practice. Christians, though, are to follow God's law, not just in latter, but also in spirit, in a more depth and encompassing charge. The standard that has been set for us is that our word should always be true. Paul writes, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, see Zechariah 8, 16. Our Savior puts it even more strongly in the form of an admonition. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. And remember this. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Your words and your actions do matter. Every single one. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Because God is with us, every word that we speak is spoken in God's presence, and thus should be true, making those unnecessary. As God's people, we are to represent Him in honesty and obedience, and reflect Him in our conduct in every way. And I'll get more, more into that point later on, of course. Because of this, 
we do not need God's name in enough to back up our word. Therefore, a Christian should simply say yes or no according to what he honestly believes to be true, even in legal matters. As Jesus says, anything we try to add to the unvarnished truth is Satan's handiwork. See John 8.44. In short, a Christian's word should be his bound. Link in the description, by the way. So let your yes be yes and your no be no. This is the same in regard to who has our devotion. Outside of a spiritual enthrallment concerning worldly devotion, idolatry, why do so many people give their allegiance, sell their souls, especially with their oaths, vows to whom they have devotion towards, such in authoritarianism, communism, fascism, etc. States, or what we see in Christian nationalism, Trumpism, QAnon, and currently Putinism as well, and what we are seeing in the war of Ukraine, especially concerning Russian Orthodox's complicity to evil and blessing Putin's war and the subsequent atrocities. In the cost of discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this is answered in more than one occurrence. In the first occurrence in chapter 11, Truthfulness of the Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this is answered as... Again, ye have heard that it was said of the of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thy nose. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of the feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, for thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your speech be yea, yea, Nay, nay. And whatsoever is more than these is of the evil one. Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. The Christian church has until now been strangely uncertain about the interpretation of this passage. Since the time of the primitive church, commentators have oscillated between a rigorism which rejects only frivolous oaths and downright preposition which rejects only frivolous oaths and downright perjury. In the early church, the commonest interpretation was that perfect Christians were forbidden to swear at all, but the weaker brethren were allowed to swear within certain limits. Augustine represents this latter point of view. He found himself in an agreement with the teaching of Plato, the Pythagoreans, Ep Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, and other pagan philosophers who maintained that oaths were beneath the dignity of gentlemen. In the Reformation confessors and confessions, it is expressively affirmed that there can be no question of Jesus prohibiting oaths exacted by the state and in a court of law, were it not such an oath expressly enjoined in the Old Testament. Jesus himself had sworn before a court of law, and St. Paul frequently employs expressions of an oath-like character. Next, in scriptural proof, the distinction between the spiritual and worldly realms was a divisive importance for the reformers. What is an oath? It is an appeal made to God in public, calling upon him to witness a statement made in connection with an event or fact, past, present, or future. By means of the oath, men invoke the omniscient deity to avenge the truth, how can Jesus say that such an oath is a sin from the evil one, satanic? The answer is not to be sought in his concern about complete truthfulness. The very existence of an oath is a proof that there is such a thing as lies. If lying were unknown, there would be no need for oaths. Oaths are intended as a barrier against untruthfulness, but it goes further than that. For there, where alone the oath claims final truth, is space in life given to the lie and is granted a certain right of life. The Old Testament had expressed its condemnation of the lie by the use of the oath, but Jesus destroyed the lie by forbidding us altogether. Here, as there, it is the same question, one and undivided, of the destruction, the untruth in the life of the believer. The oath which the Old Testament sent against the lie is seized by the lie itself and pressed into service. It is thus able, through the oath, to establish itself and to take the law in its own hands. So the lie must be seized by Jesus in the very place in which it fleets in the oath. Therefore, the oath must go, since it is 
the protection for the lie. There are two ways in which the untruthfulness can undermine the oath. Either it may actually insinuate itself into the oath, perjury, or else disguise itself in the form of an oath by invoking some secular or divine power instead of the living God. When once the lie has entrenched itself behind the oath, there was no other way of ensuring complete truthfulness but by abolishing the oath altogether, that your yea be yea and your nay be nay. This is not to say that disciples are no longer answerable to the omniscient God for every word they utter. It means that every word they utter is spoken in his presence, and not only these words, which are accompanied by the oath. Again, your words and your actions matter, and you will answer for every word you say in the final judgment. And this is a thing that many Christians seem to forget, especially those that felt the once saved, always saved, these incredibly false and double doctrines. Because they are liable to judgment, irregardless. Which I'll get be later, of course, getting into. <clears throat> Hence, they are forbidden to swear at all. Since they always speak the whole truth and nothing but the truth, there is no need for an oath, which would only throw doubt on the veracity of all their other statements. This is why the oath is of the evil one. But a disciple must be a light even in his words. It is clear that the only reason why Jesus prohibits the swearing of those lies is the concern for truthfulness. It also goes without saying that he admits no exceptions, however high the court of law may be. But at the same time, it must be admitted that the abolition of oaths is in itself no guarantee that the truth will be told. Indeed, it may only lead to its concealment. No general rule can be laid down to enable us to decide where this is, so i.e. whether an oath is desirable precisely in the interest of the truth. Each case must be decided on its own merits. The churches of the Reformation were convinced that every oath demanded by the state was covered by this exception, but it was questionable whether it is possible to lay down a general rule like this. There is, however, no question that when such a case appears to arise, an oath can only be sworn where all of its implications are first made clear beyond all doubt. Secondly, a distinction must be drawn between oaths which apply to the past or present facts, which are known, and oaths which pledge us with reference to the future. Since the profession in Christianity does not confirm an infallible knowledge of the past, the invocation of the Almighty God will serve only to establish the integrity of mind and conscience, but only to confirm statement which, after all, may be open to error. Wherever, since he is never lord of his own future, he will always be extremely cautious about giving a pledge, i.e. an oath of allegiance, which we'll begin to later, of course. For he is aware how dangerous it is to do so, and if his own future is outside his own control, how much more is that future of the authority which demands the oath of allegiance? For the sake of the truth, therefore, and for the sake of his own following of Christ, he cannot swear such an oath without the proviso, God willing. For the Christian, no earthly obligation is absolutely binding, and any oath which makes an unconditional demand of him will for him be a lie which proceeds from the evil one. In such a case, the utmost an oath can do is to testify to the fact that the Christian is bound to the will of God alone, and that every other obligation is for the sake of Jesus, conditional upon that will. If in a doubtful case of this provisio is not explicitly stated or acknowledged, the oath cannot be then sworn, otherwise a Christian would be deceiving the authority. Let your speech, however, be yea, yea, nay, nay. Link in the description, by the way. In the second occurrence, in chapter 17, The Carefree Life of the Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this is answered as well, and answered as, But where do we draw the line between legitimate use and unlawful accumulation? Let us reverse the word of Jesus, and our question is answered. Where thy heart is, there shall thy treasure be also. Our treasure may be, of course, be small and inconspicuous, but its size is immaterial. It all depends on the heart, on ourselves. And if we ask how we are to know where our hearts are, the answer is just and simple. Everything which hinders us from loving God above all things, and, that, and acts as a barrier between ourselves and our obedience to Jesus, is our treasure in the place where our heart is. But Jesus knows 
that the heart of man hankers after treasure, and so it is his will that he should have one. But this treasure is to be sought in heaven and not on earth. Earthly treasures soon fade, but a treasure in heaven lasts forever. But this treasure, Jesus, does not mean the great treasure of himself, but treasures in the literal sense of the word, treasures accumulated by the disciples for themselves. What a wonderful promise we have here. As we follow Jesus, we win heavenly treasures which are incorruptible. They are waiting for us, and one day we shall enjoy them as our own. Surely these treasures can be none other than the extraordinary, the hidden character of the Christian life, none other than the fruits of the passion of Jesus Christ which sustains the lives of the followers. If our hearts are entirely given to God, it is clear that we cannot serve two masters. It is simply impossible. At any rate, all the time we are following Jesus Christ. It would be, of course, tempting to show how far we advance in the Christian life by endeavoring to serve two masters and giving each his due, both God and mammon. Why should we not be happy children of the world just because we are the children of God? After all, do we not rejoice in his good gifts and do we not receive our treasures as a blessing for him? No, God and the world, God and his gifts are compatible because the world and his gifts make a bid for our hearts, and only when we have won them do they become what they really are. This is how they thrive, and that is why they are incompatible with allegiance to God. Our hearts have room only for one all-embracing devotion, and we can only cleave to one Lord. Every competitor to that devotion must be hated. As Jesus says, there is no alternative. We either love God or we hate him. We are confronted by either or. Either we love God or we love earthly goods. If we love God, we hate the world, and if we love the world, we hate God. It makes no difference whether that love be conscious and deliberate or not. In fact, it is morally certain that it is to be neither, and that our conscious and deliberate desire will be to serve two masters to love God and the good things in life. We shall indignantly repudiate the suggestion that we hate God and will firmly be convinced that we love Him, whereas by trying to combine love for him with love of the world, we are turning our love for him into hatred. And then we have lost the single eye, and our heart is no longer in fellowship with Jesus. Our deliberate intentions make no difference the inevitable result. You cannot serve two masters if ye be followers of Christ. Link in the description, of course. Again, you as a Christian, who and what you treasure, what you are devoted to, so is where your heart is. When it comes to being a Christian, you cannot have any other devotion in your heart except for God. If you try to follow God in anything else, be it partisanship politics, hero worship, let alone idolatry such as Trumpism, that is still considered idolatry and worldly devotion. You absolutely cannot serve two masters if you are of Christ. Apathy to evil is never far behind, and we see with the ongoing Ukraine war and the atrocities being committed by Putin's regime and blessed by the complicit to evil Russian Orthodox churches, Patriarch Hero, that they have given into worldly devotion and wedded state and church together, especially in the hatred of others. In those vows and ended up being complicit to the said atrocities. We saw this happen repeatedly in history in the modern era, era the rise of Nazism and the final solution. German churches became apathetic to evil. Dietrich Bonhoeffer condemned them and set himself against the Nazis and was martyred for it. You cannot be careless with whom. Trumpism, Putinism, cult leader worship concerning authoritarianism, which we'll begin later concerning psychology. Now, hero worship and what you give allegiance to, and you cannot be careless with what oaths you take. God will not take reneging of those lightly, and you will open yourself up to curses and far worse. So as a reminder of what the ideology behind the Russian Orthodox blessing of Putin's war and atrocities, the statement sets its organizers in opposition to the Russian world rescue mirror teaching which is essentially a contemporary Russian version of the Nazis' blood and soil ideology. As the authors explain, Russian world teaches that there is a transnational Russian sphere or civilization called Holy Russia or Holy Rus, which includes Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and sometimes Moldova and Kazakhstan. 
This Russian world, according to the ideology, has Moscow as its administrative center and Kiev as its spiritual heart. Both Ukrainian and Russian Orthodox leaders refer to the one Kievian font. From which the newly baptized Christian people of both nations arose, the Russian world is further held to be unified by a common language, common church, the Russian Orthodox Church, Moscow, Patriarch, and the common political leader, Vladimir Putin. Link in description for further on that, which of course the Orthodox uh, theologians discuss why the Russian Orthodox Church is heretical and why they are complicit to evil and a lot more. The Russian Orthodox Church under Kirill is doing their holy war against Ukraine as we speak, believing God's on their side, and we see with worldly devotion throughout history that this isn't the case and will never be, especially when church and state are unionized, wedded together. Apathy to evil always appears soon after. The Russian Orthodox Church is subsequently complicit to wounds war and its atrocities. Again, a Christian cannot have worldly devotion. Those we give, especially to others, and whose allegiance we vow to, when it comes to the harm of others, God will not count us guiltless of negligence, even if we aren't personally part of it or taking part of it. Again, it is apathy to evil. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold guiltless. To not speak is to speak. To not act is to act. Nish Bonhoeffer and Lincoln Scripture. With that said, when it comes to being of Christ, you cannot be careless with your words and your actions, let alone your oaths and your vows. Jesus warns specifically about this in Matthew chapter 12. Let's take a closer look. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good, good person out of the good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your own words you will be justified, by your own words you will be condemned. And that's Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 through 37. So a person is known by their actions and their words, and they cannot be careless by their words or their actions for every single one will be counted for against them in their final judgment. Again, on that point, a person is known by their words and their actions. A person is defined by their words and their actions. When it comes to psychology, we humans are creatures of habit, so there isn't an isolated incident or out of the blue moon when it comes to how we treat others, especially badly when it comes to fallen Christians belittling or harming others repeatedly and believing they have the right to and that they don't have to repent or atone for it and they don't believe what they are doing is wrong, and again, sin is defined as harming others. So an actual born-again Christian is known by them being of love, and a fallen Christian is the one who harms others. And that is the distinction between Christians these days, especially here in America. How you treat others really does matter. In your public life, in your private life at work, at home. Because God is still going to count it, and God is still going to count all the unrepentantness, and that is going to be held against you. And the believers of the false doctrine once saved all are saved, they believe that since they are saved, they do not have to repent for their actions. And they damn themselves to Gehenna for it. You can do things as a Christian that will no longer make you of Christ. You can do things that will empty you of the Holy Spirit. How and what you do to others really does matter. And I'll emphasize this point a little bit further as we go along. I'm sorry this is going to be super lengthy, but given everything that's been happening and the fact that I'm given church discipline path, I'm following what I've been given, unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends. Because I have to teach proper church doctrine.
again, a Christian is known by them being of love, and a fallen Christian is one who harms others. Three particular chapters with specific verses come to mind in this. Romans chapter 13 verses 8 through 10 and John chapter 13 verse 34 and 1 John chapter 2 verses 7 through 11. Yeah, I'm actually making some revisions as I'm doing this, too. I forgot to put that on the point. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. That's Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And again, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. A reminder, love does no wrong to a neighbor. And again, this is the principle when it comes to knowing he is of Christ and he wasn't, especially these days, when it comes to American Christians. Because those who are no longer of Christ are plainly seen by their actions and their words and how they treat others, especially on the daily. Because with those who follow the false doctrines of once saved, always saved, believe they don't have to repent. And again, as we'll see a bit later concerning the principles of Satanism, that they can do all they wish, that no one has authority over them, that they are gods of their own lives, that they are in control of their own lives. So when Christians are following the principles of Satanism, so they became Satanists, this is the point of understanding the corruption. And why uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 6 explicitly states in no uncertain terms what they are and what the Christian church has to do with them, which means excommunication. And again, things are much dire than you actually realize when you actually have to take into account of understanding metaphysics. And this is the point. Cause and effect. Okay, continuing. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples. If ye have love for one another, that's John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is a word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment I am writing you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother and abides in light, and in him there is no cause of stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And that's 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. Again, hatred is separation from God. Hatred is what divides an actual born-again Christian from a fallen Christian. If you have hatred in your heart for others, you are walking in darkness. If you say you are of Christ but hate others, the light isn't in you, which of course the Holy Spirit isn't either. Because you cannot exemplify the fruits of the Spirit in your own life, the Holy Spirit isn't in you. So make your choices. If you believe you can do what you wish, especially to others, those that you hate, especially as a Christian, that is pure fallenness. Human nature and worse, and those who believe do these things aren't of Christ. As a reminder, Satan disguises submission himself under the rules of personal autonomy. He never asks us to become his servants. Never once did the serpent say to Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commandment is never from Christian and from Christ to the evil, it is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will, self interest now rules and what I want reigns. 
And that is the essence of sin, and that's by an unknown orthodox theologian. As another reminder, what is their objective? Satanists wish to develop this depraved form of the devotion through a diffusion of the theory and practice of three basic principles. You can do all that you wish, no one has the right to command you, and you are the god of yourself. The first principle in testing for full liberty to the adherent on everything he wishes to do without limits. The second is a release from the principle's authority, that is, from any obligation to the bay parents, the church, the state, and whoever places a restriction in the name of the common good. The third denies all the truth that comes directly from God. Paradise, inferno, purgatory, judgment, taking man's man's precepts of the church, Mary, and so forth. And parents, these principles are seductive, especially to younger people, because they delude them and think that life is a beautiful holiday and imagine a land of playthings where everything is permitted and where your eye does not recognize any limits regarding pleasure and enjoyment. That's by Father Gabriel Amra. And on this point concerning why God allows evil and people to choose either him, following all of Jesus' tenets and commandments to the letter, especially choosing love and compassion, and removing hate, desires, or dominance of others, or choosing or not choosing God, and choosing worldly devotion, idolatry, and later apathy to evil, as we see with those so consumed by hatred, such as QAnon and Trump supporters. Here are excerpts from an exorcist that explains the demonic, the antics of Satan and his army of fallen angels, which explain in detail. First, it is necessary to make clear that God, being infinite love, does not wish evil. He simply permits it because he created men and angels as free creatures. Simply put, men are free to choose whether they wish to live for God or against him and therefore to opt for heaven or for hell. We must recognize that God has made everything to make man happy, and in accordance with his plan, God asks man to obey the laws that he has established, but God has not given man the ability to refuse this truth. This is the situation we are placed. First, the first who had to choose was we have already said were the angels who, in the case of demons, chose to tempt men in order to attract men to themselves. The second in the dimension of time is man, and so falls to each of us individually to make a choice. G John's Gospel says of Christ, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verse 3. Could God have made, could God have given to creation a greater goal than himself, than the possibility of enjoying the vision of him, the cause of eternal joy? We, in fact, live for him, and there could not be any more marvelous goal. Therefore, the rebellion of the angels and the successive disobedience of men tells us that evil is a concrete possibility and God has permitted it in order to make us free. And here we are before a great mystery, that creatures freely choose evil rather than good. This is the greatest risk that God has taken with his creatures, angels, and men. He has taken it for a simple reason, because without free will, that is, without the possibility of choosing between good and bad, we would be robots and not totally free creatures. Liberty, infinite in God, is a sign of our greatness and our sonship in Jesus Christ. Without it, we could not call ourselves sons, but only slaves. God has given us everything we must recognize only Him, adore only Him, and be guided by only Him, because inevitably, if we do not give to God, we necessarily give to idols. He who is not with me is against me, Jesus says, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. Half measures do not exist. Either we are of Christ or we are of Satan. Yeah, you can't be lukewarm Christians, in other words. At times, we would like to go halfway, serving Christ partway. Well, that is not possible. The devious method that the devil used with Adam and Eve works also with us. It leads us to think that evil and sin do not exist, that to sin, distancing ourselves from God, trying each thing for the pleasure of having experiences is a gain. So in the end, what evil is there? It is true that God permits evil, but there is another truth that accompanies it. Without our knowing, God also puts limits on evil, limiting the acts of Satan against man. We have an example of it in the book of Job. 
Satan obtains permission to vex Job, but God forbids him to touch Job. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself do you not forth put your hand. Job chapter 1 verse 12. God always has the last word. Link in description, by the way. So before I go deeper into the sermon theological dive, especially with everything that's happened here in the U.S. concerning worldly devotion, that so many Christians who fell, fell into and followed QAnon or believed Trump would be their divine savior and are enacting all these bans, laws for dominance and control concerning their Christian national beliefs, let's take a look at diabolical obsession. According to Father Gabriel Amra, diabolical obsession is defined as Diabolical obsessions are disturbances of extreme strong hallucinations that the demon imposes, often invisibly, on the mind of the victim. In these cases, a person is no longer master of his own domain and thoughts. Rather, he is subjected to the powerful force that creates mental activity in him that is repetitive, obsessive, and irresistible. Such representations of reality, even if foreign to his manner of thinking, become profoundly fixed on his psyche. The objects of these hallucinations can be manifested in visions as voices or as rustlings. They can also appear as monstrous figures, horrifying animals, or devils. In other cases, it could be impulse to commit suicide or do evil to others. And again, reminder, or do evil to others. The history of cases is so fast that it is impossible to enumerate all the forms of diabolical obsession. Link in the description, by the way. He goes a bit further in discussing spiritual changes in people when they get involved in things or practices, beliefs, which we see in QAnon and Christian nationalism. It is curious that, in a secularized and scientific era like ours, where everything is credible, incredibly must be experimentally demonstrated, so many people dive into these types of experiences that deal so strongly with the invisible world. The response is quite simple. When faith in God declines, idolatry and irrationality increase. Man must then look elsewhere for answers to his meaningful questions. This is exactly as we've gotten to witness in QAnon Christian nationalism, Trumpism. All that idolatry and belief Trump had the answers for them. As is the case with a certain friend of mine, as of recently this week, he posted a video concerning a strong belief that Trump's victory was stolen from him, though the U.S. government in every state has factually certified otherwise, I am praying for her as much as possible as I do everyone daily who has hatred in their hearts. Having to watch these idolaters and fallen Christians who, who are lost cast away, being continually stuck in their rationality loop, and understanding in no uncertain terms they are under spiritual enthrallment, certainly, and more than probably experiencing psychosis, if not worse. Outside of praying for them, what can be done? As with the main point of this message, I swore an oath to Hippocratic oath when I went medical in the Navy. The vow to at first do no harm, which means I have to help others safeguard the lives, safety of others, above all else, and I, and that my actions cannot harm others either. I made that vow and I follow it and will to the end of my days, especially as a legally ordained reverend, though with schooling and medical, psychological, and certainly spiritual. I lost my late mother to cancer, which did spur me to go medical. Even many years later now, as ecclesiastical, I help others to the best of my ability. It is an honor and a duty. If I can make someone's day better or life, I will, even if I have to talk to you at times. Everyone fallen or not, is a child of God through Jesus' death and resurrection. We all sin in some way daily and have to repent daily and atone. Everyone falls short of God's glory and whatever sin is in, is in someone, it is in each one of us, so none of us are different. We have to be better than our human nature on the daily and truly repent and atone when we do fall and especially forgive others of their sins. Mind you, you can't have forgiveness without requiring repentance. And we all have to make changes in our private lives and our spiritual lives. God knows every thought and act we do. Everyone can change, though it can take and will take time, even a lifetime. To deny people can change, slash to be redeemed, is to deny Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, and that is putting God's name in vain. This is why I condemn actions, but not the person, and I have to admonish more than anything else, as well as make sure there is accountability when absolutely necessary. And I do have to teach correct doctrine. 
certainly, and explain why. <clears throat> when it comes to understanding others and what they are capable of, again, actions of word matter and help define a person. Again, from a psychological aspect, humans are creatures of habit. For example, late last week at my day job, when it came time to do a certain task, I said I'd take care of it, and one of my coworkers said she would do it. I stated to her I'd end up taking care of it, if that was the case, given her working habits plus how busy that day job actually is. So that was the premise of the calculation, that I'd end up doing the task because of either of those two factors. Hours later, I ended up having to do the task. She said she didn't have time due to how busy it was, but that was only the half the truth, since again her actual working habits made it so she wouldn't have, have time to do it. We've been far busier times with less personnel where she was able to do the task. So like clockwork, predictability concerning why people do as they do, which when it comes to my own statements on my personal social media account about actions of fallen Christians, there is an exacting science to it. The same can be said when it comes to spiritual changes in people. The Bible, theology, church doctrine, and exorcism state why. I am reminded of the quote of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's. The most experienced psychologist or observer of human nature knows infinitely less of the human heart than the simplest Christian who lives beneath the cross of Jesus. The greatest psychological insight, ability, and experience cannot grasp this one thing, what sin is. Worldly wisdom knows what distress and weakness and failure are, but it does not know the godlessness of men. So, it also does not know that man is destroyed only by a sin and can be healed only by forgiveness. Only the Christian knows this. In the presence of a psychiatrist, I can only be a sick man, but in the presence of a Christian brother, I can dare to be a sinner. The psychiatrist must first search my heart, and yet he never plums his ultimate depths. The Christian brothers know that when I come to him, here is a sinner like myself, a godless man who wants to confess and yearns for God's forgiveness. The psychiatrist views me as if there were no God. The brother views me as if I were before the judging and merciful God in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the life <coughs> together, classical inspiration in Christian community. In conscription, by the way. Again, concerning psychology, we are creatures of habit. However, when the godlessness of man is known, Sin can be quantified, and not repentance do stack up, which many Christians who follow cheap grace and false doctrine says that once saved, always saved, do not repent for their sins and condemn themselves, unfortunately. So you can merge both worlds, at least in understanding of our human nature, that it is intrinsically evil, and that the things people suffer. So knowing why this happens is one thing. So what is hardness of heart, which is another ailment many fallen Christians have? When when hearts are hardened, the psychological equivalent is cognitive dissonance. According to the article, what does cognitive dissonance mean? The theory and definition by Mario Larler. Cognitive dissonance is defined as sorry as I butchered the last name. It's a beautiful name, by the way. Cognitive dissonance is basically this phenomenon whereby we have a natural drive for a consistency in that our belief system must be consistent with itself and it must be consistent with our actions. This is Matt Johnson, PhD, a professor and associate dean at Holtz International Business School in San Francisco. But that consistency doesn't always mean any distress can arise as a result. Festinger's original premise was that humans would prefer to live in a stable world in which beliefs are consistent with one another and actions align with beliefs. So when you fall out of that perfect harmony and either think or enact in opposition to your belief system, tension builds and you become distressed. That distress is called dissonance. The theory further suggests that present actions can influence subsequent beliefs and values a conundrum. Psychologists have noted when studying cognitive dissonance, our beliefs and values should be determine our actions, not the other way around, right? But if we accept that our beliefs or values can influence our actions and that our actions can influence our beliefs or values, that helps explain a lot of very common human tendencies, like our tendency to rationalize or justify behavior, or the way our beliefs and values change as we navigate different situations in life, and that common human pitfall, hypocrisy. It's a universal feeling that all humans have to deal with, 
Cognitive dissonance is common to everyone as we encounter different decisions and experiences in our lives that may challenge our existing belief systems or contradict some of our current belief systems, according to Kim P Psychology PST, an associate director of Sober College and Addiction Treatment Facility in Los Angeles. Recognizing the disparity between thoughts or actions is what causes dissonance and makes you feel the need to return to harmony. In any instance where our beliefs are inconsistent, we essentially have a real profound psychic discomfort and we must act in a way that resolves that conflict, Johnson says. That's because the discomfort brings a host of less than ideal feelings with it. Anxiety and distress are common, Lincoln says, and it's worth noting that the distress you feel will be more intense the more important the belief is to you. So a core value or a long-held truth being challenged, such as, example, a spiritual belief, breaking a recent commitment to New Year's resolution you weren't the, that invested in in the first place. Often, the cognitive dissonance creates a mild discomfort and will cause a huge disruption in your life, but when the dissonance is extreme or there's a huge disconnect between two conflicting thoughts or conflicting thoughts and behavior, you're likely to feel stronger to resolve the situation, psychologically speaking, to return to the state of mental stability. You'll have to do something about it. Some people rationalize behavior and others just deny it, Johnson says. Link in the description, by the way. So understanding what hardness of heart is no matter how you truly try to help those so afflicted by their own denial of reality, psychosis, concerning who they pledge, give their devotion to that legally lost election last year, a couple years ago, and they give them so many conspiracies to find justification for their belief. It's a combination, certainly, of cognitive dissonance with reality, psychosis, and certainly can necessarily be paired with the equivalent of diabolical obsession. It's the understanding that Either they are mentally ill, or they are spiritually enthralled, or somewhere in between. It is the same logic concerning racism, which is defined as a mental illness, as well as narcissism, a diagnosed personality disorder. Speaking of psychosis, let's look at the psychological aspect of the diabolical obsession concerning idolatry in America, as opposed to Russia's or any other authoritarian regime. According to the American article, The Shared Psychosis of, by Dr. Brandy Lee, <coughs> Which link is in the description, by the way. <clears throat> the reasons are multiple and varied, but in my recent public service book, Profile of the Nation, I have outlined two major emotional drives, a narcissistic symbiosis and a shared psychosis. Narcissistic symbiosis refers to the developmental wounds that can make the leader-follower relationship magnetically attractive. The leader hunger for adulation to compensate for an inner lack of self-worth rejects grandiose omnipotence, while the followers, rendered needy by societal stress or developmental injury, yearn for a parental figure. When such wounded individuals are given positions of power, they arouse similar pathology in the population that creates a lock and key relationship. Shared psychosis, which is also called folie à millions, madness of millions, when occurring at a national level or induced delusions, refers to the infectiousness of severe symptoms that goes beyond ordinary group psychology. When a highly symptomatic individual is placed in an influential position, the person's symptoms can spread through that population through emotional bonds, heightened existing pathologies, and inducing delusions, paranoia, a propensity for violence. Even in previously healthy individuals, the treatment is removal of exposure. Destructiveness is a core characteristic of mental pathology, whether directed toward the self or others. First, I wish to clarify that those with mental illness are, as a group, no more dangerous than those without mental illness. When mental pathology is accompanied by criminal mindedness, however, the combination can make individuals far more dangerous than either alone. In my textbook on violence, I emphasize the symbolic nature of violence and how it is a life impulse gone awry. Briefly, if one cannot have love, one resorts to respect, and when respect is unavailable, one resorts to fear. Trump is now living through an intolerable loss of respect, rejection by a nation, and is elected to beat. Violence helps compensate for feelings of powerlessness, inadequacy, and a lack of real productivity. If we handle the situation appropriately, there will be a lot of disillusionment and trauma. And this is all right. They are healthy, 
reactions to your abnormal situation. We must provide emotional support for healing, and this includes societal support, such as sources of belonging and dignity. Cult members and victims of abuse are often emotionally bonded to the relationship, unable to see the harm that is being done to them. After a while, the magnitude and the deception conspires with their own psychological protections against pain and disappointment. This causes them to avoid seeing the truth, and the situation with Trump supporters is very similar. The danger is that another pathological figure will come around and entice them with a false solution that is really harnessing of this resistance. Link in the description, by the way. And this is why having compassion on them is most important, especially right now with everything happening. I've noticed some local Catholics treating Trump supporters as heretics, something diseased, and having an aversion to them, with them letting them burn in Gehenna for all eternity, and which a lot of them probably will, just abandon them to Gehenna. Again, this is not the way of Christ to abandon others, especially to their sin and subsequent doom. I do not take idolatry lightly. They are heretics concerning idolatry, nor those with hatred of others lightly as well. This is why praying for those who fall is very important, and so is making certain they are legally held accountable when they harm others is necessary so that they get the mental health help they desperately need and are able to recover in time that they atone certainly for their actions and repent. Those of hatred are by default knowingly or otherwise enemies of Christ, for their rebellion against God and his will and are separated from God, so praying for them is love. For this, it is intercession to God through Jesus Christ. God will heal them, heal their minds, bodies, and souls. It may take hours, days, weeks, months, or even years. We have to be kind and compassionate. We have to be loving to all especially those so consumed by hatred or particular idolatries, knowing they are spiritually enthralled, possibly temporarily or slightly possessed, or mentally ill, or a combination of both or all. Again, compassion, kindness, and love is the only way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts this succinctly in this quote, Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This is the supreme demand. Through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead for him to God. Jesus does not promise that when we bless our enemies and do get to them, that they will not despitefully use and persecute us. They certainly will. But not even that can turn or hurt or overcome us, so as long as we pray for them. For if we pray for them, we are taking their distress and poverty, their guilt and perdition upon ourselves, pleading to God for them. We are doing vicariously for them what they cannot do for themselves. Every insult they utter only serves to bind us more closely to God and them. Their persecution of us only serves to bring them nearer to reconciliation with God and to further triumphs of love. That's the Jesus Bonhoeffer, Cost of Life, Discipleship, link in the description, by the way. We have to seek reconciliation in this fallen world. That is a tenet of Christ, a commandment we as Christians have to follow. So let us get back to the second topic point of the sermon. As for the past week or so, with the increased ban laws instigated by Christian nationalists, whose beliefs actually go against doctrine, for their control and dominance of others, and their firm belief they can do all that they wish, especially others they hate, which of course is pure antichrist, no one has authority over them, and that they are the gods of their own lives, they are in control and subsequently so don't have to submit to God, yeah, the three principles of Satanism. So let's have a refresher on Christian nationalism. According to the article of Christianity Today entitled, What is Christian Nationalism? Christian Nationalism is defined as, you've probably seen headlines recently about the evils of Christian nationalism, especially since December's Jericho March in Washington, D.C., and since the mob of Trump supporters, many sporting Christian signs, slogans, and symbols, rioted and stormed the U.S. Capitol building on January 6th. What is Christian nationalism, and how is it different from Christianity? <clears throat> what is nationalism? There are many definitions of nationalism and an active debate about how best to define it. I reviewed the standard academic literature on nationalism and found this several recurring themes. Most scholars agree that nationalism starts with the belief that humanity is divisible into mutually distinct and internally coherent cultural groups defined by shared traits, language, culture, ethnicity, or culture, 
From there, scholars say nationalists believe that these groups should each have their own governments, that governments should promote and project a nation's cultural identity, and that sovereign national groups provide meaning and purpose for human beings. What is Christian nationalism? Christian nationalism is the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Popularly, Christian nationalists assert that America is and must remain a Christian nation not merely as an observation about American history, but as a prescriptive program for what America must continue to be in the future. Scholars like Samuel Huntington have made similar argument that America is defined by its Anglo-Protestant past that we will lose our identity and our freedom if we do not preserve our cultural inheritance. Christian nationalists do not reject the First Amendment and do not advocate for theocracy, but they do believe that Christianity should enjoy a privileged position in the public square. The term Christian nationalism is relatively new, and it advocates generally do not use it themselves, but it accurately describes American nationalists who believe American identity is extremely from Christianity. What is the problem with nationalism? <clears throat> Humanity is not easily divisible into mutually distinct cultural units. Cultures overlap and their borders are fuzzy. Since cultural units are fuzzy, they make a poor fit as the foundation of political order. Cultural identities are fluid and hard to draw boundaries around, but political boundaries are hard and semi-permanent. Attempting to found political legitimacy on cultural likeness means political order will constantly be in danger of being felt as illegitimate by some group or other. Cultural pluralism is essentially inevitably in every nation. Is that really a problem or just an abstract worry? It is a serious problem. When nationalists go about constructing their nation, they have to define who is and who is not part of the nation, but there are always dissidents and minorities who do not and cannot conform to the nationalist's preferred cultural template. In the absence of moral authority, nationalists can only establish themselves by force. And of course, as we're seeing with a lot of these purely anti-Christ Christians. Scholars are almost unanimous that nationalist governments tend to become authoritarian and oppressive in practice. For example, in past generations, to the extent that the United States had a quasi-established official religion of Protestantism, it did not respect true religious freedom. Worse, the United States and many individual states used Christianity as a prop to support slavery and segregation. What do you... Yeah, again, supporting slavery and segregation, and of course... The damn on Pulse of Gehenna because of that. Because when it comes to do it others as you want them to do unto you, when people say, quite frankly, that that's impossible for them to do that, these type I tell these type of Christians, you are already fallen if you believe that. And you are marked as such. Because you have to, regardless of and again, when it comes to that excuse of the person is just a product of that generation or era. And again, that's just an excuse because there were people who lived in that time who knew that all these racist, xenophobic things were not of God and were against it. And were against the devaluation of others. I don't know. And again, your actions are worth you matter. This is why so many people, uh, especially when it comes down to lynchings and stuff, after lynching they go to a Sunday sermon. And so because of the cheap grace they were taught, and they believed what they did was right, and they deemed themselves to Gehenna for it, and they didn't repent for it, and it dragged them to hell. And this is what happened to so many. It's because of that devaluation, that belief, that they are superior to others. Again, this is how Lucifer wins when it comes to people. Because they will put that thought in their heads. And they will try to use whatever excuse to justify. Yeah. And this is why they are separated from God. The moment they believe they are superior to others. That is the moment they are separated. And again, you can see clearly these days who is oppressed and who isn't by how they treat others both in public and in private. There is no excuse. 
many people have to change, and that is the point. It's a little more dire than people realize. <clears throat> what do Christian nationalists want that is different from normal Christian engagement in politics? Christian nationalists want to define America as a Christian nation, and they want the government to promise and promote a specific cultural template as the official culture of the country. Some have advocated for an amendment to the Constitution to recognize America's Christian heritage, others to reinstitute prayer in public schools. Some work to enshrine a Christian nationalist interpretation of American history in school curricula, including the American has a specific relationship with God or has been chosen by him to carry out a specific mission on earth. Others advocate for immigration restrictions specifically to prevent a change to American religious or ethnic demographics, which we saw with the Trump's highly racist immigration system, which, of course, Biden's still following, which is why I don't support Biden. But that's beside the point. But again, every single Christian who supported Trump is either com complicit or complacent to that, and that apathy to evil. God is not going to hold them guiltless of that either. And again, we have to be very, 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 very careful with who and what you pledge to. We really need to. Because we don't understand. Which I'll get back a little bit further into this, so I'm only mm, about closer to more than halfway in. Because again, you cannot force Christianity on others. If you do so, you're a zealot, and you're actually going specifically against very specific tenets and testaments of Christ, which I'll be getting to later. And that forcing of others, that domination of others, which I will be talking about later as well, that's damnation. And they end up doing Lucifer's work for him either way. Because that belief of being superior to others that they hold in their heart, and that is their doom. Others advocate for immigration restrictions, specifically to prevent a change to America religious and ethnic demographics or a change to America culture. Some want to empower the government to take stronger action to circumscribe immoral behavior. Some, again, like the scholar Samuel Huntington, have argued that the United States government must defend and enshrine its predominant Anglo-Protestant culture and ensure the survival of American democracy. And sometimes Christian nationalism is most evident not in its political agenda, but in the sort of attitude in which it is held an unstated presumption that Christians are entitled to primacy of place in the public square because they are heirs to the true or essential heritage of American culture. Again, that superiority complex superiority to others. Again, damnation. That Christians have a resumptive right to define the meaning of the American experiment because they see themselves as America's architects, first citizens, and guardians. How is this dangerous for America? Christian nationalism tends to treat other Americans as second-class citizens. If it were fully implemented, it would not respect the full religious liberty of all Americans, empowering the state through morals Legislation to regulate conduct always carries the risk of overreaching, setting a bad precedent, and creating governing powers that would be used later against Christians. And we always see this when it comes down to authoritarianism, regardless of the country, and especially when it came down to Nazism. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to witness it, and, and he actively fought against it as best he could. And of course he was martyred for it. And of course when the came down to the rise of Trump and everything, I was reminded specifically about Dietrich Bonhoeffer's works. And again, this is why idolatry is still idolatry. They possess spirits from Rome and they doom themselves and they have no knowledge. <clears throat> Additionally, Christian nationalism is an ideology held overwhelmingly by white Americans and is thus tends to exasperate racial and ethnic cleavages. In recent years, the movement has grown increasingly characterized by fear and a brief and a belief that Christians are victims of persecution, which they are not, but God 
always does make certain consequences happen, the law of consequences. And those Christians who are dealing with the consequences of their actions don't like it because they believe they can do no wrong. But God placed the law of consequences there as the reason for the first universe its first universal law to counter our sin nature. And again, again, that hatred of theirs is their separation from God. The moment they do that, the moment they believe they are superior to others, this is the point of where they no longer are of Christ and where the Holy Spirit isn't in them. This is intrinsic, and we see this. It's those who are of Christ anyways. Some are beginning to argue that American Christians need to prepare to fight physically to preserve America's identity in an argument that played in the January 6th riots. How is Christian nationalism dangerous to the church? Christian nationalism takes the name of Christ for the worldly political agenda, proclaiming that its program is a political program for every true believer. That is wrong in principle. No matter what the agenda is, it's heretical. Because only the church is authorized to proclaim the name of Jesus to carry his standard into the world. It is even worse with a political movement that champions some causes that are unjust, which is the case with Christian nationalism and its attendant illiberalism. In that case, Christian nationalism is called evil good and good evil. It has taken the name of Christ as a fig leaf to cover its political program, treating the message of Jesus as a tool of political propaganda and the church as a handmaiden and cheerleader of the state. And again, we're seeing this with the Ukraine war. With the uh, Russian Orthodox Church blessing Putin's war and all the atrocities we've seen because they are complicit to all those deaths. And they're binding themselves to Gehenna because of all these actions. Again, we cannot be apathetic to evil. God does not hold out guiltless. Christian nationalism is not just heretical, as stated in the Bible and theology. We Christians are one church across the world. We are of Christ and have unity in Christ. Those who are Christian nationalists do tend to divide that which they are spiritually not to do, doing Lucifer's work for them. They are marked as such spiritually, and we see the results of it. But also a false doctrine and false belief. We do see the spirit of anger so prevalent in Christians, those that gave way to Christian nationalism, Trumpism these days, making them no longer of peace love and they don't follow Matthew's day in God's image. First John chapter four verses seven to twenty one, let alone any of Christ's tenets and testaments. We see the failure of them exemplifying the fruits of the Spirit as well, with hatred and anger, both being a driving force for them, which again in Galatians chapter five, now the works of the flesh is are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, Dissensions, divisions, which of course in Christian nationalism is divisions. So envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, English Standard Version. The reality of this transformation of these Christians into fallenness is that they will not inherit the kingdom of God due to the hatred and anger both being separation from God. Lucifer's aim is to take as many souls with him, so those tactics of separation from God are very evident. So before we get further into this, let's take a re brief refresher on why hatred is so dangerous. According to the article, Why Hatred is So Dangerous by Bethany Verrett, hatred is defined as the root of evil is rebellion against God, his nature, and his will. People came in their fleshly desires, whether instinctively or intentionally, when they set themselves against God. The Bible makes it clear that God is love, he is the source of love, the giver of true life, and because that love will continue into eternity, since he is eternal, hate is sinful opposition to that love. It is the driving force behind much of the wicked actions people take. Sometimes it is hating others, hating a process, or hating oneself. God's word has so much to say on the topic, emphasizing its toxic influence, Phanuka's nature, and how much it hurts the Lord. It is selfish emotion that sets man against his creator and his brethren, damaging everything he touches because it allows people to see their fellow man is not also made in the image of God. To know the love of God is to be touched by true love. Embracing that enables people to overcome the fleshly drive to hate and become more Christ-like. Like many topics, the Bible is not silent about hatred. It is the opposition. 
emotion and behavior that Jesus Christ epitomized when he came to die on the cross, paying the price for the sins of humanity. The dictionary defi defines it as ill will or resentment that is usually mutual, prejudice, hostility, or animosity. This definition does not seem to fully encapsulate hatred as often the driving force for the worst of human behavior, including murder, the intentional ending of a life. Hate is not just an emotion, it is a state of being that involves choices, behaviors, and thoughts. It separates people rather than brings them together because the one hating sets themselves away from one another. They can do it on superficial reasons for understandable res ones as well. Racism is an example of hatred driven by ethnic differences. Some people hate others due to religious differences. Individuals often hate one another due to past wrongs, refusing to seek reconciliation. Ultimately, hate can lead to people not seeing the object of their hatred as fully human, justifying bad behavior on either a petty or a grand scale. Many people experience anger. Some even have tempers that manifest in ways that are detrimental to their relationships. Getting mad at someone does not mean the relationship is hateful. Even modern psychology identified differences between the two, with anger being passing emotion, even for those who struggle with anger management. Hate actively separates people from one another because it is an active decision to otherwise, a word that means to view or treat as intrinsically different from an alien to oneself. It refers to someone being seen as so alien to oneself or a culture that they can be perceived as lesser, perhaps even less than human. Instead of seeing people as made in the image of God, they can be eliminated. Anger can lead to hate and often feels it, and that does not necessarily mean that they are the same. Hate drives people to set themselves in opposition to God, as well-meaning actions driven by hatred are rebellion. One of the most powerful statements in the Bible comes from one of the last epistles of the New Testament written by one of the apostles. John wrote, we know that we now have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. 1 John chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. This verse makes the bold claim that if someone calls themselves a Christian but is hateful against anyone, especially another believer, they may not have the Holy Spirit and may not be truly saved. Hate is intimately tied with death. And just like Jesus called someone embracing lust an adulterer, someone harboring hate is murdering his brother in his heart. When this hate is acted upon, it leads to death. Sometimes that is spiritual or relational. Unfortunately, it can also be the ending of a life of another. Hate is dangerous because when taken to its logical conclusion, it is a desire to eliminate the humanity of another. Link in the description, by the way. Hatred is separation. Those who have it and allow the spirit of hate to dominate them no longer have the Holy Spirit within them from God. And as we know with Christian nationalism, what we've seen in the Ukraine war, the Russian Orthodox blood and soul ideology being antichrist and then being complicit to evil in Putin's war and subsequent atrocities, Christian nationalism here in the U.S. is no better thanks to its domin dominion and domination theology, which of course and is, of course, heretical and antichrist, which all Trump supporters, QAnon adherents, are part of, knowingly or otherwise. So let's explore why Christian cannot dominate others by force and laws. According to the GotQuestion.org article, should Christians try to force the kingdom on others? As a background to the discussion of Christian kingdom, please read our article on Christian Reconstructionism, a teaching cluster related to the Dominion theology and Themenonly, this line of theology interpretation states that biblical Christianity will rule all areas of society, personal and corporate, and that the goal of Christians is to create a worldwide kingdom patterned after the moral aspects of the Mosaic Law. Those who hold this belief view that Christ will not return to earth until such a kingdom, a Christian kingdom, has been established. The principal goal of Dominion theology and Christian Reconstructionism is to establish a literal Christian kingdom. When the Christian kingdom is in place, believers will hold political and religious domination of the whole world. 
The leaders of the Christian kingdom will implement the moral laws of the Old Testament and mete out the related punishments for infractions of that law. The sacrificial and ceremonial laws will not be a part of the Christian kingdom as those have been fulfilled in Christ. The Christian kingdom will not be a secular government system ruled by the church as much as it will be a government confounded and conformed to the law of God. The Bible does not advise us to seek to establish a physical Christian kingdom. God had such a plan for Israel when they took control of the promised land. But in the New Testament era, he has never called his people to establish a political kingdom ruled by his laws, commands, and statutes. Jesus said plainly that his kingdom is not of the, this world, and unlike the followers of worldly political leaders, his followers do not use force to establish the kingdom. John chapter 18, verse 36. The mission of Christians is not to strive to take worldwide dominion and set a Christian kingdom, but to share the gospel of salvation with the whole world. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When people are saved, the Holy Spirit will begin his work in them, changing their lives to confirm to God's word. Philippians 1, 6, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. When the gospel spreads, society is changed, one heart and one life at a time. Attempts to change societies and cultures from without will always fail. Just taking control of political process or establishing moral laws will not affect change in people's hearts. Christianity cannot be forced on people, and the Christian kingdom is not a biblical concept. Changing people, yeah, again, it's not a biblical concept, so it's heretical, in other words. And again, all Christian nationalists are heretics, as are Trump supporters. And welcome to understanding of church doctrine. And welcome to understanding of theology. And welcome to the world we live in. And I'll get a little bit further. When, mm. Well, we're almost there at this point, so let's continue. <clears throat> Changing people from inside out is God's work through his Holy Spirit. God is more interested in saving people's souls than he is in forcing people to obey his laws. If an unsaved person is forced to obey God's laws, he would be doing so out of fear and obligation. God wants a person to come to repentance, 2 Peter verse 3, chapter 9, and then to obey his commands out of reverence and love. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. God has not called us to enforce his commands on an unredeemed world. We cannot force people into a Christian kingdom. Rather, he has called us to reclaim the message of salvation, the redeeming power, and life transforming message of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Link in the description, by the way. Again, we as Christians cannot force salvation on others. Those creating these restrictive laws have no legs to stand on because of their willful desire to dominate others in their beliefs of superiority and because of what they are doing and what they believe, these Christian nationalists are already one foot in Gehenna. And I do have to affirm this as a legally ordained reverend, that they are Antichrist, not Christians, officially or otherwise. They fail not to stay in God's image regardless. Their dominion theology, like once saved, always saved doctrine, is a false doctrine and a devil's doctrine, which even if they actually followed it, the metrics of their judgment system will again return to their own heads, and they will be found wanting and lacking. Their intent to decide the road to hell is paved in good intentions. For those believing they are saving lives of babies but do nothing to ensure actual pro-life, the anti-abortionist crowd is filled with Christian nationalist Trump supporters, and there is an increased hatred and far worse within them all, which we get to observe through the news, personal interactions, and there is a history. For again, they are defined by their actions and their words, which aren't of Christ to begin with. Always. I, for example, on a personal level, outside of purely medical, possible death of mother, medical complications, as well as victims of rape and incest, am against abortion, since in clinical terms, it is a termination of life, and I do not disagree with theology on this, nor church doctrine. And as someone who cherishes life, I am against the death penalty, 
and am against gun violence. I am against our current immigration system. Trump's was highly racist, and Biden is doing no one any favors adhering to it, which is the main reason why I do not support Biden on both moral and ethical grounds, and consider it not humane, certainly. When it comes to women, however, I am not, nor ever will be, an enemy of women. I have to step aside entirely from my personal viewpoint on abortion, for I am not one to subjugate others. This goes against Christ's tenets and testaments. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, nor am one to be subjugated. I do follow moral authority and obey ethical human laws. Those with ethical authority over me as long as there is accountability. And again, when it comes to moral authority, they have to be held accountable as well. And the thing is, I am held accountable for my actions and for my words. There are, there are people I answer to, and there are people who hold me accountable. And anyone who has authority over others has to be held accountable. Because human nature is evil. And we have vows and we have oaths, and God will make certain we are to follow. <clears throat> I am not an enemy of women, so if there is the best way to eradicate abortion, we as a society have to address root causes of pregnancies that are unwanted. So I'm for increased access to medical, women should have easy access to safe birth control, affordable child care, affordable health care, affordable housing, mental health pairing with age appropriate education concerning consent and sex education. I am absolutely for holding my gender accountable for unwanted pregnancies, which that same judgment metric I myself am to be also held to without exception by others. So if abortion was outlawed, then all males will be held to equal measure without exception. One of my friends shared a quote which I agree. If abortion is illegal, then a man leaving a girl who is pregnant should be illegal too. If women can't back out of pregnancies, neither should men. It's called you have to be responsible. And if you do not want that responsibility, tough luck. I mean, the downside about being ex-military, at least with me, I'm for accountability and discipline, because I myself had to endure it. <clears throat> Regardless, sin is sin, no excuse. If a male gets a woman pregnant, he is to be held responsible for his actions. If he doesn't want that responsibility, he refuses, has no honor, then force child support if the male refuses to marry, take responsibility on the federal level if they abolish abortion and if they, if they, the male, don't make payments, the male should be jailed until they pay the last penny. So if you want to place such draconian restrictions on others as a Christian, be prepared to have the same judgment metrics handed back to you, especially by non-believers. But the Bible and theology are very clear on this too, incidentally. This is why, outside of my personal beliefs concerning abortion, I am not for taking women's rights away, let alone any human rights away, nor will I ever be party to human rights violations. Though I will not sign my name to defend Planned Parenthood, but I will sign my name for increased societal programs to help women which addresses the root causes of unwanted pregnancies concerning social services, medical, child care access, and access to safe birth control, etc. And especially holding my own gender accountable without exception. Murder is murder, and murder is also murder. Everyone is murderers already concerning God's metrics on anger. Dietrich Bonhoeffer states in the cost of discipleship why anger is anathema to God and is considered murder in God's eyes. The first law which Jesus commands his disciples is the one which forbids murder and trusts their brother's welfare to their keeping. 
The brother's life is a divine ordinance, and God alone has power over life and death. There is no place for the murderer among the people of God. The judgment he passes on others falls on the murderer himself. In this context, brother means more than fellow Christian. For the follower of Christ, there can be no limit as to who is his neighbor, except as his Lord decides. He is forbidden to commit murder and under pain of divine judgment. For him, the brother's life is a boundary which he dare not pass. Even anger is enough to overstep the mark. Still more, the casual angry word, raka, and most of all, the deliberate insert of our brother, thou fool. Anger is always an attack on a brother's life, for he refuses to let him live and aims at his destruction. Jesus will not accept the common distinction between righteous indignation and unjustifiable anger. The disciple must be entirely innocent of anger because anger is an offense against both God and his neighbor. Every idle word, which we think so little of, betrays our lack of respect for our neighbor and shows that we place ourselves on a pinnacle above him, so that's superiority right there, and value our lives higher than his. The angry word is a blow struck at our brother, a stab at his heart, it seeks to hit, to hurt, and to destroy. A deliberate insult is even worse, for we are then openly disgracing our brother out of the world and causing others to despise him. With our hearts burning with hatred, we seek to annihilate his moral and material existence. We are passing judgment on him, and that is murder. And the murderer will himself be judged. When a man gets angry with his brother and swears at him, when he publicly insults or slanders him, he is guilty of murder and forfeits his relation to God. He erects a barrier not only between himself and God, but also between himself and God. He no longer has access to him. His sacrifice, worship, and prayer are not acceptable in his sight. For the Christian, worship cannot be divorced from the service of the brethren as it was of the rabbis. If we despise our brother, our worship is unreal and it forfeits every divine purpose. Let the fellowship of Christ examine itself and see whether it has given any token of the love of Christ to the victims of the world continually in contempt. Any token of that love of Christ which seeks to pre preserve, support, and protect life. Otherwise, however the truly correct our service are, and however devote our prayer, however brave our testimony, they will profit us nothing, nay rather, they must needs testify against us that we of a church have ceased to follow our Lord. There is Therefore, only one way to follow in Jesus and worshiping God, and that is to be reconciled with our brethren. If we come to hear the word of God and receive sacrament without first being reconciled with our neighbors, we shall come to our own damnation. Link in description, by the way. Again, their worship is in real, and they, and when they harm others, and as Joan, God will not hear them as long as people have cause against them. And if they make prayer and supplication, and go for sacraments, they condemn themselves to their own damnation as long as people have cause against them. These fallen Christians try to dominate others and do so many things that are antichrist. We have this here in the U.S. and we are witnessing an ongoing war in Ukraine. Hatred is separation from God. So trying to dominate others, that is entirely antichrist. Which Dietrich Bonhoeffer also states and why a Christian cannot do so. Dietrich Bonhoeffer makes his way further in chapter 18 and the disciple and then believers in the cost of discipleship. But this arises a question in the relationship between the Christians and their non-Christian neighbors. Does their separation from the rest of society confer on them special rights and privileges? Do Christians enjoy power, gifts, and standards of judgment which qualify them to exert a particular authority over others? How easy it would have been for the disciples to adopt the spear attitude to pass unqualified condemnation on the rest of the world and to persuade themselves that this was the will of God. That is why Jesus had to make it clear beyond all doubt that such misunderstandings would seriously imperil the discipleship. The disciples are not to judge. If they do so, they will themselves be judged by God. The sword where they judge their brethren will fall upon their own heads. Instead of cutting themselves off from their brother as just from the unjust, they find themselves cut off from Jesus. Why should this be so? The source of the disciples' life lies exclusively in his fellowship with Jesus Christ. He possesses his righteousness only within that association, never outside of it. That is why his righteousness can never become an objective criterion to be applied at will. He is a disciple not because he possesses such new standard, but only because of Jesus Christ, the mediator and the very Son of God. That is to say, his righteousness is hidden from himself in fellowship with Jesus. He cannot, as he could once, be the detached observer of himself and judge himself. For he can only see Jesus and be seen by him, judged by him, and reprieved by him. 
is not an approved standard of righteous living that separates a follower of Jesus Christ from the unbeliever, but it is Christ who stands between them. Christians always see other men as brethren to whom Christ comes. They meet them only by going to them with Jesus. Disciple and non-disciple can never encounter each other as free men, directly exchanging their views and judging one another by objective criteria. No, the disciple can meet the non-disciple only as a man to whom Jesus comes. Here alone, Christ fights for the soul of the unbeliever. His call, his love, his grace, and his judgment comes to his own. Discipleship does not afford us a point of vantage from which to attack others. We come to them with an unconditional offer of fellowship with the single-mindedness of the love of Jesus. If the disciples make judgments of their own, they set up standards of good and evil. But Jesus Christ is not a standard which I apply to others. He is judge of myself, revealing my own virtues to me as something altogether evil. Thus, I am not permitted to apply to the other person that which does not apply to me. For with my judgment, according to good and evil, I only frame the other person's evil, for he does exactly the same. But he does not know the hidden iniquity of the good, but seeks his justification in it. If I condemn his evil actions, I thereby confirm to him to his apparently good actions, which are yet never the good commanded by Christ. Thus we remove from him the judgment of Christ and subject him to human judgment, but I bring God's judgment upon my head, for I then do not live by any moron, and out of the grace of Jesus Christ, but out of my knowledge of good and evil, which I hold on to. Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we bind ourselves to our own evil, and to the grace which only others are just as entitled as we are. But if the love of Christ we know all about every conceivable sin and guilt, for we know how Jesus suffered and how all men have been forgiven at the foot of the cross, Christian love sees the fellow man under the cross and therefore sees with clarity. If when we judge others our real motive was to destroy evil, we should look for evil where it is certain to be found, and that is in our own hearts. But if we are to look out for the evil in others, our real motive is obviously to justify ourselves, for we are seeking to escape punishment of our own sins by passing judgment on others, and are assuming by implication that the word of God applies to ourselves in one way and to others in another. All this is highly dangerous and misleading. We are trying to claim for ourselves a special privilege which we deny to others, but Christ's disciples have no rights of their own standards of right and wrong which they could enforce with other people they have received nothing but Christ's fellowship. Therefore, the disciple is not to sit in judgment of his fellow man because he would wrongly usurp the jurisdiction. But the Christian is not only forbidden to judge them, even the word of salvation has its limits. He has neither power nor right to force it on other men in season and out of season. Every attempt to impose the gospel by force to run after people and proselyze them, to use our own resources to arrange the salvation of other people, is both futile and dangerous. It is futile because the swine do not recognize the pearls that are cast before them, and dangerous because it profanes the word of forgiveness by causing those we fain would serve to sin against that which is holy. Worse still, we shall only meet with a blind rage of hardened and darkened hearts, and that will be useless and harmful. Our easy trafficking with the word of cheap grace simply bores the world with disgust, so that the end of it turns against those who try to force it on it what it does not want. Thus a strict limit is placed upon activities of disciples, just as in Matthew chapter 10, they are told to shake off dust off their feet where the word of peace is refused a healing. Their restless energy which refuses to recognize any limit of their activity, the zeal which refuses to take note of resistance, springs to confusion of the gospel, the victorious ideology, an ideology which requires fanatics who neither know nor notice opposition, and is certainly a potent force. But the word of God, in its weakness, takes the risk of meeting the scorn of men and being rejected. There are hearts which are hardened and doors which are closed to the word. The word recognizes opposition when it meets it and is prepared to suffer it. What are the disciples to do when they encounter opposition and cannot penetrate the hearts of men? They must admit that in no circumstances do they possess any rights or powers over others, and that they have no direct access to them. The only way to reach us is through him, in whose hands they are themselves like all other men. The disciples are taught to pray, and so they learn that only way to reach others is by praying to God. Judgment and forgiveness are always in the hands of God. He closes and he opens. But the disciples must ask, 
They must seek and knock, and God will hear them. They have to learn that their anxiety and concern for others must drive them to intercession. The promise that Christ gives to their prayer is a joyous weapon in their armory. To sum up, it is clear from the foregoing that the disciple has no special power or privilege on his own in all his intercourse with others. The mainspring of his life and work is the strength which comes from fellowship with Jesus Christ. Jesus offers his disciple a simple rule of thumb which will enable even the least sophisticated of them to tell whether his intercourse with others is on the right plane or not. All they need to do is say, I have stood a thou and put himself in the other man's place. All things whatsoever ye would do that men should do unto you, even so do ye yourself unto them. That is the law of the prophets. The moment he does that, the disciple forfeits all advantage over other men and can no longer excuse in himself what he condemns in others. He is as strict in condemning evil in himself as he was before with others and as lenient with evil in others as he was before himself. The evil in the other person is exactly the same evil in ourselves. There is only one judgment, one law, and one grace. Henceforth, the disciple will look upon other men as forgiven sinners who owe their lives to the love of God. This is the law and the prophets. This is none other than the supreme commandment to love God above all things and our enemies as ourselves. As each Bonhoeffer stated, there are limits, especially when Christians that fell to hatred and wrong try to force others, non-believers, to conform to their hateful beliefs on how society should be. When fallen Christians breach the limits God placed upon them, there is always the law of consequences which is enacted. Those who follow the false doctrine once they have always saved and cheap grace cry out about persecution and or cancer culture. However, God uses people to ensure justice is enacted when we do wrong. Again, these fallen Christians breach limits God placed on them. There is always a law of consequences which is enacted. Those who follow the false doctrine once they've always saved in cheap grace cried about persecution and cancer culture. However, God uses people to ensure justice is enacted when we do wrong. The victims of these fallen Christians get to make the decision what is to be done with them. And this is the point that you seem to forget. They, non-believers, get to make that decision. And there are so much spiritual dangers these fallen Christians do not realize they were placed in because of their own actions, their own hatred, is their separation, and their own damnation. And you as a Christian have to be very careful with how you treat people. And I'll get a bit later in this. So, again, be very careful with what you do, what you say to others. Be very careful with how you treat others. This is the most dire, especially when it comes to everything that is happening, everything that is supposed to happen concerning Revelation. You, as a Christian, have limitations. You, as a Christian, have very specific things you have to do to be a Christ for the Holy Spirit to be within you. If you fail at any time in any of the stuff, especially allowing hatred into your hearts, and hatred, of course, is a cancer, Guess what? That's the point of when that person falls, and they no longer oppress, and they are in opposition to God, and Lucifer uses those taking hearts to unspeakable evil. It's a red fully proven. We see this all the time, and every time. we like clockwork. So again, be very careful with what you say and what you do to others. You have to as a Christian. Because every single person, every single human, is your brother and sister, regardless if they are a Christian or not. Your actions and your words matter. You can't be careless. The law of consequences is exact. The reality is, God gives warnings before he enacts punishment, since the father does have to discipline his children to make people want to change. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you, 
as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is the dis discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there in whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8. Again, when a fallen Christian asks me, why does God hate them? My response is always, who did you harm and why did you believe you could harm them? There is a reason why, and again, when it comes to what the Christian nationalists are doing concerning their agendas and the Supreme Court's decision, when innumerable and incalculable consequences occur and people suffer. At the end of the day, their own desire to, for domination is their own undoing and damnation. They will try to blame others. Got to love that narcissism and other psychopathy and sociopathy, depending on which as a physical side effect of what is happening spiritually in them. But at the end of the day, their desire to dominate isn't of Christ nor God, and again, they are liable for judgment, especially by non-believers and by their victims, both. Outside of intercession, I cannot interfere or intervene in people's fates. Your choices and how you treat others do matter. Speak of domination that fallen Christians try to use justified to their own ends, Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us about the Christian church and Christians in general. When it comes to the work towards the salvation of Christians who fall, fallen Christians, we have to work towards their salvation even if saving them from themselves at times concerning having to hold them accountability to accountability when they harm others, and to legal accountability for that matter. The brother is a burden to the Christian precisely because he is a Christian. For the pagan, the other person never becomes a burden at all. He simply sidesteps every burden that others may impose upon him. That's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Life Together, the classic exploration of Christian community. So when it comes to majesty and the fact Christians cannot dominate others. God did not make this person as I would have made him. He did not give me to me as a brother to dominate and control, but in order that I might find in him the creator. Now the other person, in the freedom in which he was created, becomes the occasion of joy, whereas he was only a nuisance and an affliction. God did, does not, will that I should fashion the person according to the image that seems good to me, that is, in my own image, Rather, in his very freedom for me, God made this person in his image. I can no longer forehand know how God's image should appear in others. That image always manifests completely new and unique form that comes solely from God's free and sovereign creation. To me, the sight may seem strange, even ungodly, but God creates every man in the likeness of his son, the crucified. After all, even that image certainly looks strange and ungodly to me before I grasp it. That's where Dietrich Bonhoeffer left together, classical exploration and Christian community. The church is the church only when it exists for others, not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell men of every calling what it means to live for Christ, to exist for others. That's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Letters and Papers from Prison. When it comes to how you treat others, as well as when you receive accountability for your actions, God uses others to make it so. Sometimes you'll encounter angels as well. When dealing with people day to day, you have no knowledge of what exactly or whom you are dealing with. That is why you have to be very, very careful how you treat others. And this is the double meaning of Majesty day in God's image. Jesus stands at the door knocking, Revelation 3.20. In total reality, he comes in the form of the beggar, of the desolate human child in ragged clothes asking for help. He confronts you in every person that you meet. As long as there are people, Christ will walk the earth as your neighbor, as the one through whom God calls you, speaks to you, makes demands of you. That is a great seriousness and great blessedness of the Advent message. Christ is standing at the door. He lives in the form of a human being among us. And that's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, God is in the manger. God created the law of consequences. As the first universal law after the fall of man to counter our negative actions. The Christian, in fact, does not have special privilege or power to dominate and control others if they are actually of Christ, and slash having the 
Holy Spirit in them. For those victimized by hateful, bigoted acts of other Christians have cause against them and are completely justified to throw them to the courts, to hold them legally accountable for their hatred and wrong, and to answer the question, what shall be done with them? And this is where the other shoe drops. Because again, you as a Christian have limitations. And you are not superior to others. This is a fact. If you believe you are superior to others, this is going to be either or, because that is a, a pure antichrist thought and belief. So that comes from Lucifer and not God. So there is that. And there is a mental Ill illness, personality disorder, narcissism. And then I, I have to treat such individuals as either or or both. Which means when they harm others, I have to intervene. And then I have to decide what to do concerning them. Legal accountability becomes necessary. And that's the point. Because again, you as a Christian cannot be apathetic to evil. Either. God is going to not count you guiltless. If you see someone suffering, help them. If you see people suffering, you can't be complacent here, you can't be complicit either. Especially when people are harming other people. You as a Christian have to intervene. This is a great charge. The least you do to others, you do unto me. This is why when it comes to the final judgment, many Christians will say, to Jesus, Lord, Lord, and Jesus will state correctly, I do not know you. Because what you did the least of these, you did unto me. And that is also the double meaning of the match for the day. Again, you as a Christian have very set things you have to do. And failure to comply is rebellion against God. You can make your choices. But what happens to you after, especially with what, how you treat others, as I said, this is the point of, the best thing I can do is intercede for others, and I do this daily. And it does take a lot of my time, daily especially, <laughs> through prayer and supplication to God. Because I have to do the best intercession on their behalf. Is that is love. That is love. Taking, doing your best for others. Interceding on their behalf. This is why prayer is important. Prayer is powerful. Because God will listen, especially when those prayers are made in love. Again, you as a Christian have to be very careful with what you do to others. Again, God knows your thoughts and counts every hateful thought as sin to begin with. You are, as a born-again Christian, cannot justify your sin beforehand either. No matter how you try to justify your hatred of another person, it is still considered anathema to God, and you are counted as an open rebellion against God and are separated from Him. Hatred is itself its own damnation. How you judge others, that metric will be handed back to you, a sword to your own head, especially if you have hatred for another. Again, you as a Christian are defined by how you treat others. If you believe you are superior to others and can command, dominate, and control them, and control their lives, you are absolutely fallen, and in no uncertain terms will not inherit the kingdom of God. You are separated from God and are in that rebellion, and originally separated God due to that hatred of another, which is an anathema to God, who is love. Anger and hatred are both separation from God, and so is idolatry, QAnon, Trumpism, and it's unsurprising that all this Antichrist is coming from this area of Christianity, Christian nationalism. If you want to look for signs of demonization outside of witchcraft and sorcery, look at where and who hatred is emanating from. 
For Lucifer uses those with hatred and hearts the unspeakable evils. For there are types of demonic spirits, hate and anger, which are used to dominate others who give into the temptation to bond suggestion to harm others. Again, the demon cannot make a person do something they don't originally want to do. However, the person can stop before they commit the said actions at any time that the demon is suggesting tempting them to do so. Again, easily up to 70% plus of American Christians are no longer of Christ nor God because of their hatreds and beliefs they can do all that they wish, especially to others. Justifying their sins beforehand is cheap grace. So what is cheap grace? According to the Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, cheap grace is defined as Instead of following Christ, let the Christians enjoy the consolations of his grace. That is what we mean by cheap grace, the grace which amounts to the justification of sin without the association of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and who from whom sin departs. Cheap grace is not the kind of forgiveness of sin which frees us from the toils of sin. Cheap grace is a grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is a preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Just by the standard in Luther's doctrine that his followers was unassailable, and yet their orthodoxy spelt the end of the destruction of the Reformation as a revelation on earth of the costly grace of God. The justification of sin in the world degenerated in the justification of sin and the world. Costly grace was turned into cheap grace without discipleship. Luther, Luther had to say that all we can do is to no avail however good life we live. He said that nothing can avail us in the sight of God but the grace and favor which confers a full forgiveness of sin. He spoke as one who knew that the very moment his crisis he was called to leave all that he had the second time and follow Jesus. The recognition of grace was the final radical breach of his besetting sin, but it was never the justification of that sin. By laying hold of God's forgiveness, he made the final radical renunciation of a self-willed life, and that breach was such as that it led to another serious following of Christ. He always looked upon it as the answer to the sum, but the answer which had arrived at by God, not by man. But then his followers changed the answer to the data for a calculation of their own. That was the root of the trouble, for if by grace is God's answer the gift of the Christian life, then we cannot for a moment dispense with the following Christ. But if the grace of the data of my Christian life means that I set out to live a Christian life in the world with all my sins justified beforehand. If I can go and sin as much as I like and rely on this grace to forgive me, for after all the world is justified in principle of our grace, I can therefore clean my worst secular existence and remain as I was before, but with the added assurance that the grace of God will cover me. It is under the influence of this kind of grace that the world has been made Christian, but at the cost of secularizing the Christian religion as never before. Link in the description, by the way. Cheap grace is damnation, according to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. These fallen Christians believe in that they can dominate others. Again, it's also damnation, let alone demonic. That is why they are not of Christ, nor the Holy Spirit is within them. When it comes to preachers of hate, teachers of hate, false doctrines, and those who follow said doctrines, like one, false doctrines, once saved, always saved, all idolaters as Christians, Second Peter chapter 2 like, perfectly describes them, fallen Christians then, and fallen Christians now, and Hebrews chapter 6 specifically declares what to do with them. They are to be winned, excommunicated, cast out. Anyways, you as a Christian have to exemplify the fruits of the Spirit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self control. If you do not, and are especially not of love, the Holy Spirit isn't in you, and you are not of Christ, nor will inherit the kingdom of God either. Again, we as Christians do not have power over others. Christian nationalists trying to dominate others, they are pure antichrist for their absolute failings of Christ's tenets and testaments. And for following these false doctrines, they are in direct opposition to God and are to be treated as cast away, lost, fallen, and excommunicated, and be excommunicated until they repent and atone. Without exception, I might add. Again, their victims and non believers both have a cause against them and are justified in seeking accountability and answering the question what is to be done with them? If believers do sacraments before God before atoning, reconciling with those whom they have harmed, they are condemning themselves to their own damnation. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, paraphrasing, 
So outside of praying for them and holding them to legal accountability when they attempt to harm others or, or when they try to dominate others to try and create laws and bans, what can we do? When it comes to Hippocratic Oath and those I swore, I have to safeguard our lives, which means protecting the weak and the innocent from those who wish to harm them, defending their victims from them and making certain there is accountability, to treat, take care of others and make certain spiritual and mental health needs are met, and try to make the world better around me by my own actions by helping those around me in need, I follow this oath especially as a legal ordained reverend. I am vowed to help others above all else, which also means when I have to deal with someone so consumed by hate and wrong, I have to confront them as someone of peace. When someone is dominated by the spirit of hate and anger, types of demonic spirits that attempt people to give to suggest new people to harm others, carry out malicious and malevolent acts, peace and prayer go hand in hand, for you cannot battle hatred of the hatred. Lucifer, as irrevocably proven, uses those with hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. So you have to battle hatred with love and strive for peace by peaceful means. Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it plainly in this quote, The followers of Christ have been called to peace, and they must not have peace, but make it. And to that end, they renounce all violence and tumult. In the cause of Christ, nothing is to be gained by such methods. His disciples keep the peace by choosing to endure suffering themselves rather than inflict on others. They maintain fellowship where others would break it off. They renounce hatred and wrong. In so doing, they overcome evil with good and establish the peace of God in the midst of a world of war and hate. Link in the description, by the way. I have to be of peace and love. If I do not, as a Christian, I give Jesus a lie and lead myself to my own damnation. In prayer, we do for them what they cannot do for themselves, and that is intercession. That is love. Again, we are commanded to seek reconciliation in this fallen world, even when our own human minds are considered it impossible, considering it impossible, of course, as human nature was intrinsically evil. Further, when it comes to battling evils of this world, especially hatred and those knowingly or otherwise felt to Lucifer, we are given the task to seek peace by peaceful means. We cannot be malicious or malevolent and call ourselves Christians. We can't have to renounce all violence and tumult as those being of Christ love good. Do not do so as to give Jesus a lie, and there are consequences, both immediate and long-term, the law of consequences. So always be careful with what you do, especially in regard to how you treat others if you call yourself a Christian. There are spiritual dangers. When it comes to pledges of vows, be very careful with who you pledge to. Apathy to evil always isn't far off, and what you sign your signature to. When it comes to politics or anything in general, God will hold you accountable, especially concerning negligence and the harm of others, regardless of knowingly complacent or complicit. This is the reality that many Christians do not realize, the spiritual dangers of their oath pledges that they sign and take. Christians cannot cherry-pick when it comes to following Jesus' commandments. You have to follow all. Those who follow cheap grace doctrine, such as what saved, always saved, as well as dominion theology, do this, however, unknowingly become opposition to Christ in the end. As a Christian, two particular scriptures come to mind as a roadmap to follow in everything that is currently happening. Let love be genuine, bore what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. <clears throat> now this I testify, I'm saying testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. 
But that is not the way you learn. Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, so put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, and true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work his own hands, so that he may have something to share with everyone in the need. Let no corrupting tongue come out of your mouths, but only such as good as building up out of fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. Again, we have to be of love. There is no exception. We have to help others. We have to be kind, caring, and compassionate. We, have, we cannot follow the ways of the world, worldly devotion, and its contempt, hatred of others. We have to battle and die to our nature daily, repent daily, and be renewed by reading, listening to God's word, and by being at peace, standing up to and denouncing hatred and wrong, and protecting the victims of the world's contempt and hatred. Spiritually and far more, we cannot be malicious or malevolent, but must exemplify the fruits of the Spirit, forgive, help others, and make the world a better place by our own actions. We have to, we cannot dominate or control others, for that is not the way of Christ. It is the way of Gehenna, though. We have to love, both be of love and exemplify it, and if we proselyze our own actions and how we treat others, by those actions, we will, if we make a non-believer question their disbelief in God, we truly are of Christ, and that is the metric to be used. So, in closing, help your communities those in need around you, and help those who need help around the world. Love others, love both your neighbors and the, those around you and your enemies, those who wish to do you harm. Be an example of love and change you want to see in the world by your own actions, good works. If you make others question or disbelief in God, the Holy Spirit is truly in you. So be a proponent of change and stand against hatred and wrong. Renounce and denounce all violence and turmoil, and those who seek dominion over others, for they were not taught in Christ, and are spiritually marked as not of the body of Christ. This is what Christians have to do. To strive for peace, justice by peaceful means, and to be of love. For this is the commandment we always have had to follow, and to do otherwise, we are not of Christ, as Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. We are oathed to be of love without exception when we become followers of Jesus Christ and join him in death in our baptism and subsequently we became children of God as Jesus' brothers and sisters. So we cannot fail that oath, for there are many spiritual dangers, least of all spiritual death. Stay safe, everyone, and God bless. But I will leave with this quote and a reminder, and as a reminder and a warning. The path of discipleship is narrow and is fatally easy to miss one's way and stray from that path even after years of discipleship, and it is hard to find. On either side of the narrow path, deep chasms yawn. To be called to a life of extraordinary quality, to love up to it and yet be unconscious of it is indeed a narrow way, to confess and testify the truth that is in Jesus, and at the same time to love the enemies of that truth, his enemies and ours, to love them in the infinite love of Jesus Christ, it is indeed a narrow way. To believe the promise of Jesus that his Father shall possess the earth, and at the same time to face our enemies unarmed and defenseless, referring to incur injustice rather than do wrong ourselves, is indeed a narrow way. To see the weakness and wrong in others, and at the same time refrain from judging them, to deliver the gospel message that casting pearls before swine is indeed a narrow way, the way is untamely hard, and at every moment we are in danger of straying from it. If we regard this way as the one way we follow in obedience to an external command, if we are afraid of ourselves all the time, it is even an impossible way. But if we hold Jesus Christ going on step by step, we shall not go astray. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cost Discipleship. Anyways, everyone, stay safe and God bless.